Welcome to Bladed Tech Musings, the channel dedicated to retro tech, innovation, science, and technological entertainment. This is part 7 of our coverage of the SpaceX Dragon 2 Demo 2 launch and docking at the International Space Station. Part 1, the launch, was covered in short 18. Part 2, the docking, was covered in short 19. Part 3, the speeches, was covered in short 20. Part 4, the booster, was covered in short 21. Part 5, the capsule, was covered in short 22. And Part 6, the spacesuit, was covered in short 24. Links to all six can be found below. The Dragon 2 capsule, for all of its modern amenities, appears to have more in common with the 1950s and 1960s spacecraft designs from the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs than the space shuttle. Is the design a step back in spacecraft development? Not really. To understand why the space shuttle was designed the way it was, it is important to understand its planning origins that of the Space Transportation System Proposal of 1969. The STS plan envisioned a permanent space infrastructure that featured a large low-Earth orbit space station capable of housing scores of docking facilities and hundreds of personnel. This space station would serve as the launching point for all future Moon and Mars missions, as well as act as the port for a fleet of freighters and tugs that could transfer cargo between Earth-based orbiters and intrasolar system spacecraft. To make such a large enterprise possible, NASA needed orbiters that were as reusable as commercial airliners and capable of a similar short post-flight turnaround time. At least 50 shuttle flights per year were envisioned, if not more. It just wasn't possible to satisfy the huge volume of cargo and large number of orbital launches needed with a Mercury, Gemini, or Apollo capsule. This was the design task North American Rockwell faced when they were the winning bidder for the space shuttle in August of 1972. What they accomplished was a technical marvel. Unfortunately, what they achieved was also an enormous operational failure. Shuttles took too long to build, cost too much to construct, cost too much to operate, took too long to turn around between flights, and were essentially hand-built, one-of-a-kind spacecraft that bore little in similarity with each other. The shuttle program was such a colossal debacle that not one other aspect of the space transportation system was built, and the U.S. manned space program foundered helplessly from 1973 to 2020, a stretch of 47 years. Only the International Space Station, more a low-Earth orbit science station rather than a real space station, benefited from the shuttle program, and even that benefit was lost when the shuttle fleet was retired in 2011. However, it is this need that drove NASA to consider a commercial crew development while it poured money into what was eventually dubbed the Artemis Moon Program, and it was the commercial crew development program that brought back the bell-shaped capsule as a sensible compromise between function and cost, perhaps shelving the idea of a glide re-entry orbiter for good. We reviewed the history of the space transportation system, the space shuttle, and the origin of SpaceX and Boeing's commercial entry into the ISS resupply mission, once dominated by U.S. defense contractors and Roscosmos in episodes 30, 32, and 33. The links to those episodes can be found below. SpaceX's Dragon 2 crew capsule ended up being the first to be certified for manned space missions by NASA and thus was the first to launch a manned mission in May of 2020. Boeing's first Starliner crew capsule launch is tentatively scheduled for no earlier than the third quarter of 2021. Let's take a look at the important differences between the SpaceX Dragon 2 and the North American Rockwell Space Shuttle. We'll also contrast Dragon with their RKK Energy and built Soyuz MS spacecraft. Given that Roscosmos bills NASA $90 million per seat, we would be remiss not including the Russian spacecraft in our analysis. In a post-Demo 2 liftoff interview, astronaut Doug Hurley described the launch as feeling totally different than the shuttle, adding that it was smooth and then it got a little rougher. Hurley, who as spacecraft commander was in charge of the launching, landing, and recovery for the Demo-2 mission, also flew on the space shuttle's final mission. Astronaut Bob Benkin, who is the Joint Operations Commander, agreed with Hurley, saying that he was surprised a little bit at how smooth things were off the pad. The space shuttle was a pretty rough ride heading into orbit with the solid rocket boosters, and our expectation was, as the Falcon 9 flight continued into the second stage, that things would basically get a lot smoother than the space shuttle did. But Dragon was huffing and puffing all the way into orbit, 
there was not quite the same smooth ride as the Space Shuttle was up to main engine cutoff. A little bit less G's, but a little bit more alive is the best way I would probably describe it. The main difference, as noted by Hurley, is the propellant in use. The Space Shuttle used two solid rocket boosters for flight, designed to send the vehicle up to 150,000 feet. Each solid rocket booster weighed 1.3 million pounds, with a motor that used 1.1 million pounds of propellant that consisted of aluminum plus ammonium perchlorate iron oxide, and some other materials. The solid rocket boosters added thrust for the first two minutes of flight before giving way to the liquid fuel-powered main engines. Using solid fuel, unlike liquid, makes it easier to store and makes the development process cheaper. But as French rocket pioneer Jean-Jacques Barry could have told you from hard-won experience, solid fuel burns more unevenly than liquid fuel. It is this reason that is likely why the launch phase felt smoother to the two astronauts. The nine Merlin engines that fire the Falcon 9 and gives the rocket its name use supercooled liquid oxygen rocket propellant to provide 1.7 million pounds of thrust at liftoff. On the other hand, once the shuttle's main engines fired with liquid propellant from the main booster and the solid rocket boosters were jettisoned, the rough ride experience from the solid rocket boosters leveled off and the ride improved. So much so that Benkin and Hurley felt the shuttle's ride was better than the Falcon 9 boosted Dragon 2 at that stage of flight. It was not clear why the three RS-25 shuttle engines were superior in terms of thrust consistency over that of the nine Merlin 1D engines on the Falcon 9. A major field of development in the last decade has been automation, with spacecraft now able to perform complex functions such as docking with the International Space Station almost entirely autonomously. The Dragon 2 still needs two astronauts on board to be ready to take over controls in case there are any issues. But if everything goes to plan, then the large majority of piloting the aircraft will be done automatically. However, should the astronauts need to control the Dragon 2, the system that they'll use is very different than the one in the Space Shuttle. The Space Shuttle had thousands of switches, buttons, and screens for inputting and displaying information of all kinds about the vehicle. But while this level of control is important, the sheer volume of inputs could cause issues. The shuttle had 2,000 switches and circuit breakers, observed Hurley. So there were almost too many in some ways. You really had to be careful actuating a switch because it was very easy to hit the switch next to the one you wanted and to perhaps make things worse rather than better if you were adjusting the vehicle. The Dragon 2 uses a touchscreen based system instead, so there are far fewer buttons and inputs and displays are combined into one. Advances in user interface design have helped to develop a system that has all the options that are required, but is easier to interact with. Hurley described the three touchscreen displays between the two pilots as intuitive, which, along with a higher level of automation, allow the crew members to focus on their mission rather than on the details of operating the vehicle. For all its many achievements, the Space Shuttle program is also remembered for its deadly accidents. Over its 30-year active period, the shuttle program lost two craft in serious disasters, the shuttle disaster in 1986 and the Columbia disaster in 2003. In both cases, all those aboard were killed, resulting in a total of 14 lives lost. These disasters occurred either during the launch or landing periods, which are actually the most dangerous. Once a craft reaches orbit, it is relatively safe, but getting there and back is the dangerous part. One reason that these two accidents were fatal is that not only were they using older technology, there were also limited emergency escape options for the crew. There were also what are called black zones across the launch periods, in which it was impossible for the crew to abort or eject from the spacecraft, even if they knew something was going wrong. Modern spacecraft like the Dragon 2 are therefore designed with an emphasis on systems that allow crew members to eject if there is a problem. They have what is called end-to-end -end abort capability, meaning the astronauts can be ejected away from the rocket at any point from launch to orbit in case something should go wrong. SpaceX and NASA have spent a great deal of time testing these systems on the Dragon 2 in what are called escape abort tests. So although the first test flight of a new spacecraft is always risky, the safety systems should be considerably better than those of the space shuttle. The big difference between the Dragon 2 and the Space Shuttle, of course, is how they land. The Space Shuttle looked somewhat like an airplane because it was essentially an unpowered glider 
which would descend through the atmosphere and gradually glide back down to Earth borne on wind currents. That was the theory, at least. Despite North American Rockwell's best efforts, the shuttle air dynamics were not much better than a brick. Landing a space shuttle onto a runway was still a highly precise, highly challenging endeavor. The Dragon 2, however, is much lighter and has a round capsule shape without wings for gliding, much like the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo capsules during the 1960s and 1970s, or the Soyuz capsule that currently launches humans to space. When the Dragon 2 is ready to return from orbit, it jettisons all non-essential parts and enters the atmosphere, using drag to slow its speed somewhat. It then releases parachutes, which further slow its descent, until it splashes down into the ocean from where the astronauts can be collected. A capsule design is a pretty tried and true design. It's a pretty safe design with different onboard capabilities from the pad all the way up into space, which the space shuttle didn't have that capability, Benkin said during a pre-launch media teleconference. I think from that perspective, it's a reliable design. Yet, despite returning to a capsule, SpaceX's spacecraft is very different from any other previously designed capsule or even Boeing's Starliner, which is being developed under the same NASA contract as the Crew Dragon. For one thing, the Dragon 2 will have a touchscreen for the astronauts to operate instead of a joystick, something Benkin and Hurley, who were military test pilots before becoming astronauts, were not accustomed to. Growing up as a pilot my whole career, having a certain way to control the vehicles, this is currently different, but you know we went into it with a very open mind, Hurley said during the same teleconference. The difference is you've got to be very deliberate when you're putting an input with a touchscreen relative to what you would do with a stick, because when you're flying an airplane, for example, by pushing the stick forward, it's going to go down, but now I actually have to make a concerted effort to do that with a touchscreen. Benkin, wanting to emphasize the point that the Dragon 2 was an evolutionary step beyond the Apollo capsule and the space shuttle, continued. This spacecraft Crew Dragon is SpaceX's design, start to finish, and make no mistake of that. Unlike the Soyuz capsule that only takes approximately six hours to head to the ISS when it lifts off the pad of the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, the Demo-2 trip to the space station was three times as long after it departed from the Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A. This is due to orbital mechanics, explained Benji Reed, SpaceX Director of Crew Mission Management. It's about when you launch, Reed told reporters a week before the Demo-2 mission start. There are many things that you have to do to get to the space station, and so you look at different launch opportunities based on weather and a whole number of other factors, and you determine when it's the best time to launch. You set up a number of launch opportunities, and some of those launch opportunities require more phasing time, and some of them require less. That means the Demo-2 capsule could have a shorter orbit time if SpaceX and NASA had opted for a different launch date, but the whole point of the Demo-2 mission is to test out the capsule with humans on board. Therefore, teams want to ensure Benkin and Hurley can complete all the criteria and tasks needed on the Dragon 2 in order to greenlight future operational flights. Of course, the Soyuz capsule has been operating for decades, giving Roscosmos and Energia the experience needed to shrink its flight path to the space station. NASA fully expects SpaceX to be able to shorten the Dragon capsule's travel time as they gain similar experience. One final difference between the Space Shuttle and the Dragon 2 has less to do with the vehicles themselves and more to do with the management of the projects. The Space Shuttle was developed and managed by NASA, while the Dragon 2 is developed and is managed by SpaceX with NASA's oversight and cooperation. Space exploration is an expensive business, and NASA projects like the Next Generation SLS Launch System have come under fire for going over budget and costing the public too much. SpaceX has demonstrated its commercial approach may be able to provide launch services for considerably less. NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine's focus during his tenure has been to make space exploration more affordable for NASA by commercializing low Earth orbit and by the agency becoming a customer of private companies like SpaceX. Space exploration doesn't work if the U.S. government is both the supply and the demand for space services, he has often noted. The agency must strive to create demand for space services and cultivate supply. Bridenstine's approach is not without its detractors. Retired astronauts and engineers are concerned that private companies will not be as fastidious with multiple layers of redundancy as space agencies are when building their equipment, leaving fewer options for recovery should anything go wrong. In either case, private space exploration is coming whether it is wanted or not, and projects like the SpaceX Build Dragon 2 will only become more common in the future through NASA's commercial crew program and others like it.
How do you think the Dragon 2 compares to the Space Shuttle? Is the comparison favorable, or does one or the other present serious drawbacks? Share with us by dropping a comment below. We hope you enjoyed this 37th episode on the BTM channel. If so, click that like button. Not a subscriber yet? Clicking the subscribe button and the bell notification icon will help both our YouTube standing and keep you informed when new episodes are released. Links to our previous episodes can be found below. Stay connected by occasionally checking our Instagram feed, where we post content from our upcoming episodes and from episodes past that you may have missed. Make sure you follow our Twitter account, where all new episodes are announced. And finally, join us on our Facebook page, where we cover current news and events related to channel content. Thanks for watching.